verses 35 to 38. So we think about because of who he is, we pray. Matthew 9, 35 to 38, you'll recognize this passage. It's not the first time we have considered it in our journey together here. But it seems a very fitting passage for us to consider today as we think about the importance of prayer in the whole mission enterprise of taking the gospel to the nations. Stand with me if you would and just follow along as I read this passage. If you don't have your Bibles, we've got the text on the screens for you. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord take this today and stir in us anew and afresh a sense of the priority of prayer in our lives individually, in our homes, and together as a congregation on those occasions that we've marked out for that practice. Thank you. Be seated. If you've been involved in Southern Baptist life for any time at all, you know that every year around the Christmas season, uh, talk begins to be had about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for foreign missions. I remember a fellow telling me about a, a man in his church, and they were having a business meeting in the Christmas season, and he's having some question time. And he said, I want to know something. I said, yeah. I said, when are we going to pay this Lottie Moon off? Well, he didn't understand it clearly. Uh, you don't. You don't. Lottie Moon, uh, Charlotte Diggs Moon, was a missionary. Converted under the ministry of, of John Broadus, uh, one of the founders at Southern Seminary. Called by God to go to the foreign field, and she went to China. And she labored there until she died. And when you go through and look at her collection, which probably a lot of it's available online today, one of the stark uh, things that stand out in her collection was she wrote continually back home saying, where are the men? Why won't the men come on the field? We need the men. She would teach because she was so careful about the, the distinction between women teaching women but women not teaching men. She would teach with a sheet set up and teach the women and would let the men on the other side of the sheet overhear what she was doing, but she had no desire to directly be a teacher of men. She, she honored the scriptures too well. Made a tremendous impact for the gospel. Uh, took her monies that were sent to her and used them to, to clothe and feed the Chinese children, so much so that her frail frame wasted away. Finally, uh, in a boat in the Bay of Kobe in Japan, she died, having given her life for ministry. A little side note, she was, she was courted by Crawford H. Toy, a professor at Southern Seminary, with plans to marry him. And he became a liberal and moved away from the authority of scriptures, and she broke off the engagement and remained single her entire life, giving her life to missions. So Southern Baptist, to honor her effort and her zeal, began what's called the Lottie Moon a Christmas offering for foreign missions. 100% of that money goes to the International Mission Board uh, so that our missionaries, uh, I'll not call their names because this goes onto the internet, but our missionaries are supported by them. The couple coming in next week have finished their seminary training and they, in January, will begin to be supported by the International Mission Board through our cooperative program giving and through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. 100% of the money taken up in this offering goes directly to international missions to support our missionaries. And if you've been reading Baptist News in recent days, our new leader, David Platt, who's a very capable man, 
is taking and making the hard decisions, making cuts to get the budget back in line. No longer willing to kick the can down the road. And it's going to mean the bringing off the field of some of our missionaries the first time we've ever had to do that. And so I want us to go through and think about because of who He is, because of who God is, what that means for us. This week, because of who He is, we pray. Next week, because of who He is, we give. And we'll show you some things next week that I think you'll find very interesting uh, to you. I want us to think about this passage just for a few moments under three headings. First, Jesus' far-reaching concern, verse 35. Second, Jesus' genuine compassion, verse 36. Third, Jesus' command to pray in the light of that, verses 37 and 38. First of all, his far-reaching concern. It's interesting that the text, our text tells us he, he went throughout all the cities and villages. It's, now, we don't take that to mean that every city and every village has received a visit by him, but he, it was an expansive thing. He was teaching in the synagogues when they would let him. You remember one time he taught at Nazareth and they, his, his sermon was ended by them racing upon him, grabbing him, hauling him out of the synagogue to take him and throw him over the cliff. It, he wasn't always well received with what he had to say. But he did when they would let him teach in the synagogues. He would preach the gospel of the kingdom. It was healing diseases and afflictions. He was touching people where they hurt. We read earlier in Luke chapter 10 verse 1, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him. Now, to understand this, he appointed 72 in addition to the 12. 72 others. He sent them two by two, and we know he sent the 12 out two by two. It's not clear if at this, at this setting he sent them out as well. But if he did, send them out two by two into every town and place where he himself would go. So you either had 36 or 42 cities where Jesus intended to go, uh, ad experiencing an advance uh, going by his two that he was sending out two by two. He sent them ahead of him. You know, folks, I think there's still a principle there today that we need to consider. We need to ask ourselves, first of all, where is he sending us? Do we have the far-reaching concern that Jesus had? For some, that will mean going across the street. For some, that will mean going down the street. For some, that will mean going into the marketplace. For some, that will mean going somewhere else in, in the state of Oklahoma or in the United States. For some, it will mean crossing the oceans into foreign fields. But, but it all starts with the same far-reaching concern that Jesus had. You see, if we don't deal with that, and how do we get that, by the way? We pray. We pray, and he's going to tell them that here shortly. But we pray. I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. You won't think yourself into missionary imperative. You won't feel yourself into missionary imperative. You will pray yourself into that. Your heart will be moved by the things that move the heart of God. Do we have the far-reaching concern? You may say, well, Pastor, sometimes I think my heart's kind of cold. That's okay. It's not the unpardonable sin. Pray. Pray. I promise you this. My evangelism professor, Dr. Roy Fish, said to us one time, he said, you can't talk to God very long about men without, being, without talking to men about God. That's impossible. So we pray. We pray, dear God, give us the heart that our Savior had. Described here, he went throughout all the cities and villages. And yet Luke contextualizes this and says he sent the 72 and possibly the 12, two by two, so 36 or 42 cities were engaged by those he sent out. He sent them ahead of him. I think that's what he does for us. We say, oh Lord, we want you to move in such and such a place. Well, is he asking us to be the ones to go into that place? Is he asking us to pray that God will raise up some from our midst who will go into that place? Perhaps there's an area of your town, your neighborhood, that you would long to see a greater gospel foothold. Have you prayed and considered that perhaps God is sending you ahead where he will go? Is it not presumptuous for us to think that he will go anywhere that we're, that we're not willing to go, not willing to send people? 
So we start with prayer on that, I believe. The second thing I want you to see is, is his genuine compassion in verse 36. He saw the crowds. He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It's so critical for us, again, not only to, to have the far-reaching heart and look that Jesus has, but to have the heart of compassion on the crowds. And the crowds are made up of individuals, and so there'll be individuals in this. But I find myself asking in this day and time, when you see the crowds, what's your heart response? If we're not careful, it's too easy for us to grumble about the crowds. The crowds get in our way. The crowds have it all wrong. The crowds are consumed with things that don't matter. The crowds are not good for our mental and spiritual health. Well, we don't need to join the crowds, okay? But oh, that God would help us to see the crowds as Jesus saw them. That his heart response was compassion. That he saw them not as a nuisance, not as an irritant, not as that which was making society worse than it had ever been, not that which was taking our nation down roads and places that we never thought as a nation we would go. But he saw them, had compassion. Because he saw them for what they were. They were harassed and helpless. The greatest need in America today, whether in the White House, the State House, or the house down the street, the greatest need is for them to meet the shepherd. They're sheep without a shepherd. They're lost sheep. They're only acting. I, I confess to you, I get frustrated with our president and, and his, his administration. And I'll be honest, I don't care to hear a word he has to say tonight on national TV because I've heard it all before. But his greatest need is not to listen to Republicans, not to listen to his critics. His greatest need is to listen to the living God, to hear the gospel and be saved. That's his need. How do we see him? How do we see others? Do we see them as scattered, harassed? We say, well, no, I, I, really, I really see that I'm harassed because of them. Well, Jesus warned us of that. In this world, you will have trouble. If, they've, if they hated the shepherd, they're going to hate the sheep. But are we able with the, with the heart and the vision of Jesus to see them as they are, with compassion? I believe the more we pray for us to have compassion, the more a heart of compassion will be expressed. That's, that's easier, I think, for some than it is for people like me who just get all exercised but it's necessary nonetheless to pray Lord help me to see the masses help me to see the crowds who have no care for you or what care they have makes a mockery of you help me to see them in, not with disdain not with disgust but with compassion help me to see them for what they are they are harassed by the enemy of their souls they are helpless. They're only doing what's within their power to do. They are shepherdless. And as much as you are my shepherd, and I know I shall not want, because you make me to lie down in green pastures, because you lead me beside still waters, because you restore my soul, because you lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake, you anoint my head with oil. You, my cup runs over. You prepare a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. Lord, because of this, help me to see them as needing you as their shepherd. Thirdly, I want you to see his command to pray in the light of this. Having seen these things and expressed these things, verse 37, then he said to his disciples, that is in the light of this, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The continual dilemma. Two billion people in the earth have yet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, have yet to hear one 
word about a Savior who died for them. With all the migration going on in, in Muslim territories, the, the fleeing from their homeland because of the fear of death, more Muslims are coming to faith in Christ now as they realize they're having to run from fellow Muslims, run for their lives. And they're running into the arms of people like International Mission Board missionaries who are waiting for them when they arrive on the shores. Running into people like Samaritan's Purse, the ministry of Franklin Graham, who are waiting for them when they arrive on the shores. And there's a video out where a fellow says, look, here come some refugees on a boat. We'll be the first Christians they've ever met. And they engage them with love and compassion. There's a lot of upheaval in the world today. But mark this down. There are more Muslims coming to faith in Christ now than at any time in history. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So he says, therefore, pray earnestly. It's, a, it's an intense form of prayer. Pray intensely to the Lord of the harvest, <laughs> the one who causes the seed to germinate, the one who causes the sprout to come above the ground, to the blade and then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. The Lord of the harvest, who is responsible for the harvest that is there, pray that He will, and it's, it's too soft, send out. That's not the word in the Greek. It's a compound word. It literally means pray that He will throw out laborers into His harvest. Thrust them out. Thrust them out. Oh, what to God that laborers were willing to go willingly. Often that's not the case. And as we pray this, do not be surprised if you have a feeling and a sense of God throwing you into an area where you're not comfortable, where you would not have necessarily volunteered to go. Because the prayer is, pray the Lord of the harvest to throw out laborers into his harvest. Paul said it this way in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1, Finally, brothers, pray for us. Now, what do he want you to pray for? That the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. What's right to pray for pastors, missionaries, for one another? Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead, may run freely, and be honored be received as it happened in Thessalonica. Well, let me close this up here with three lessons. Three lessons from this text that I want you to take away with you today. First of all, our heart for the unsaved and unreached should extend as far as the heart of Jesus extends. And that's, so I think I need to pray, Lord, I want my heart to be like your heart toward, toward the lost and toward the saved. Mold my heart. Shape my heart to express your heart. Stretch it, Lord, that it would go, it would extend as far as your heart extends. I don't want to be callous. I don't want to be critical. I don't want to be someone who, who acts like an American who happens to be a Christian. I want to be a Christian who happens to be an American. Help my heart to extend as far as your heart does. Secondly, our vision of people should be the same as that of Jesus. We should see them as he sees them. I confess to you, it's too easy for me to see, uh, even particularly this day and, and this, this week, it's easy for me to see Muslims as terrorists who need to be exterminated. There are some, I don't know how many, who have forfeited their right to live by being murderous. The scripture teaches that. But that's not true of all. Couldn't be true of all. Otherwise, we would not be seeing the phenomena of more Muslims coming to faith in Christ now than at any time in history. Oh Lord, give me your vision of people. Let me look at the homeless, the downtrodden, the down and out, not as, not as leeches upon society, 
but as the harassed, the helpless, whose greatest need is not a meal, that may be what they think it is, but their greatest need is a shepherd, the saving touch of Jesus. Third and finally, we must place a high priority on praying to God to enable us to see the fields ready to be harvested, to send out laborers into the field, and then be willing to be the answer to our own prayers. O Lord of the harvest, thrust out laborers. And then if we hear him say to us, go. No, Lord, thrust out laborers. I am. Go. We need to be willing to make prayer a high priority in your, in your closet time, your, your personal devotion time, in your family time. This be, it needs to be a part of what you pray. And then as we gather at midweek and we pray, we're having a wonderful, some wonderful teaching in the midweek time now. I encourage you to come and pray with us. But to pray the Lord of the harvest. Oh Lord, thrust out laborers. And then, as Isaiah said, and the question was asked, who shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. Be willing to be the answer to our own prayers. Let's pray together.